Welcome back everybody to the criminal law. In this lesson we are moving away from the definition of theft as part of our property offences or, or dishonesty offences depending on how you want to construe it and instead are talking about fraud. Now this lesson isn't actually going to include that much by way of definitions or information necessarily. We're just going to take an introduction to fraud. Um, fraud is probably the easiest offence of all um, to understand. It's the most simple, it's the one with the least amount of case law, uh, arguably, um, uh, given it's the one that probably takes up the least amount of pages in, a, in an ordinary textbook, at least in my opinion anyway, um, because really it just builds on some of the things that we've studied in theft. So you will notice the connection and the similarities between theft and fraud quite quickly, hopefully at least, you quite quickly, and as a result of which we can come to um, basic conclusions about what fraud is uh, relatively quickly and relatively easily. This is the second main property offence that we're covering in this series. Obviously we're talking about the subject of fraud. And like I said, again, um, it doesn't require too many lessons. We'll just spend a little bit of time on this. We're only going to spend a little bit of time in this video, at least. It's a relatively easy subject to understand once we have studied it. It doesn't require too many lessons at all. So as an introduction to fraud, fraud is something that, until the passage of new legislation, in fact, was in, uh, actually an encompassing of a number of different criminal offences. So the new legislation that we'll get to in a second uh, sort of codifies and, and mushes together what fraud was into, into this new offence. Um, but at least prior to that, we have sort of all encompassing different offences that had uh, various different uh, ideas and names. Um, fraud itself became, a, became the crime that we know it today as a result of the 2006 Fraud Act. Not to suggest that there wasn't fraud before 2006, it is just that the Fraud Act codified a lot of these offences and really brings them together into one piece of legislation. So, as a basic understanding, the Section 1 of the Fraud Act outlines the different types of fraud that exist. Now, the different types of fraud that exist is a little bit of a misleading way of putting it, because fraud itself is fundamentally one kind of crime uh, one kind of crime that um, has with it a number of very similar characteristics but it can be done in a different a number of different ways if that makes sense it is still basically the same crime but it is the different circumstances in which it is performed that gives it the certain different types of fraud and this is what section one outlines so section one says that a person is guilty of fraud if he is in breach of any of the subsection any of the sections sorry listed in subsection 2 if we then go on and move to look at subsection 2 it says that the sections are section 2 um, which is fraud by false representation section 3 which is fraud by failing to disclose information and section four which is fraud by abuse of position so essentially these are all the same offense in the same in the sense that they're all fraud but they are fraud in different circumstances and you come about the fraud itself as a result of different acts themselves if that makes sense so they all fall into the category of fraud they all lead to the same end result the same end result of being guilty and convicted of fraud but the way you get there depends on the uh, circumstances of the facts of a particular case you may have committed fraud by false representation or maybe you have committed fraud by abusing uh, your position or failing to disclose information all of which constitute fraud for the purposes of this act a person who is guilty of fraud is liable uh, on summary conviction to imprisonment for a term not exceeding the general limits in a magistrate's court or to a fine not exceeding the um, statutory maximum or both but they could also be convicted on indictment, which is obviously something that is a little bit more serious. And um, on conviction on indictment to imprisonment for a term not exceeding 10 years or to a fine or to both. Before we finish, then, let me just quickly touch on the nature of fraud, the idea of fraud uh, and the, the, the kinds of ways in which fraud exists. Um, even though it is, uh, while it is seen as new legislation, at least, or in the new legislation, fraud is seen as something of a conduct crime rather than a result 
crime. Um, this obviously makes sense. It means that essentially causation is not necessary to show an instance of fraud. And we will see this when we start looking through the different pieces of the legislation that um, causation isn't necessarily there. Um, causation because, of course, there is not necessarily an end result that needs to be um, achieved in order for somebody to have committed fraud. And so we shift away from the idea of it being a result crime to the idea of it being a conduct crime. So that's basically an introduction to fraud. The next lesson will go into more detail looking at the first of these types of fraud, which is, of course, fraud by false representation, as codified in Section 2 of the 2006 Fraud Act. Welcome back, everybody, to our studies in the criminal law. In this lesson, what we're going to be doing is talking about fraud, specifically fraud by false uh, representation. Now, this is the first of the major elements of the offence of fraud. Now, what I would be instructing you to think about when you look at these various different pieces of legislation is the fact that fundamentally they all have the same underlying fundamental principles. Fraud is and can be seen either as one single offence with lots of different elements to the offence or lots of different types and ways in which the offence may be committed, or it could be seen as lots of different offences. I prefer to choose to, to, to think about it more as really the idea of fraud being one fundamental idea, but that is committed in lots of different ways, okay? And you will see why I think this is the case, given the fact that, at least fundamentally, at least when it comes to the fundamental principles that relate to fraud, um, they, 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 they stretch across each of the different types of ways in which one can commit fraud. The only difference between fall, fraud by false representation and fall, fraud by um, um, abuse of position, for example, is the ways in which you commit the fraud. This lesson, as I've mentioned, is going to talk about fraud by false representation. Now, fraud by false representation is codified in Section 2 of the legislation, the Fraud Act of 2006. And it says that when it comes to fraud by false representation, a person is in breach of this section if he dishonestly makes a false representation and intends by making the representation to make a gain for himself or another, or to cause loss to another, or to expose another to a risk of loss. It's as simple as that. Uh, a, we'll get to this in a second. Um, fundamentally, then, there are lots of different ways um, and lots of different fundamental principles that not only exist in and around all fraud cases and fraud offences, but also, for the most part, any kind of property offence. So the idea of dishonesty is present in this idea of fraud by false representation. Of course, the concept of dishonesty, um, we can link all the way back to the cases of Ivy, the cases of Barton, the case of Ghosh, for example, all of which are cases that involve theft. However, uh, or not even all of them involve theft, but the idea of dishonesty is, is consistent across theft and fraud. So in order to commit fraud by false representation, you first have to dishonestly make a false representation. We'll get to what this means in a, sing in, a in a second, in a couple of seconds time. And then there has to be an intent. So whereas, for example, fraud, uh, sorry, theft is the, is the dishonest appropriation of property with the intent to permanently deprive, fraud by false representation is the dishonest making of a false representation with the intent to gain or to cause another loss or risk of loss. This is essentially the, um, you can see very clearly here that theft and, theft and fraud are very, very similar offences and have very, very similar parallels between them. It's uh, such that even their definitions are quite similar as well. Section 2, subsection 2, talks about the idea of the false representation. It defines, on, it defines what it means when it suggests that a representation is false. It says that a representation is false if it is untrue or if it is, or if it is misleading, and the person making it knows that it is or that it might be untrue or misleading. Subsection 3 says that representation... So um, we, we've, we've, we've thought about what fraud is in, in, in section 2, subsection 1, defining what fraud is, making a false representation with the view to gain or to cause another to lose. 
we've defined what makes a representation false i.e a something that is untrue or misleading or uh, the person and and sorry the person making it knows that it is untrue or might be untrue or misleading and then finally then subsection three it defines what a representation is a representation means any representation as to fact or law including a representation as to the state of mind of the person making the representation of any other person so a representation is simply a, a way in which you can present fact or law, um, including uh, that of a state of mind of the person who is making that representation or even a, the, the state of mind of any other person. So that's what the offence of fraud by false mis uh, a, a false representation actually um, is and what it requires. Let's think about the mens rea element then. It's relatively simple to understand, does not take in, uh, too much to get your head around in terms of trying to work out what the mens rea is. Fundamentally, just like with the concept of theft, the mens rea for fraud by false representation is dishonesty, as defined in Ivy. Um, uh, and so when we look at the uh, concept of, of dishonesty, uh, we would make the same comparison between theft and when we look at fraud. It should be noted, however, that um, the Theft Act, Section 2 on dishonesty, does not apply to fraud cases. It is the common law understanding of, uh, of dishonesty rather than the, the ways in which they define dishonesty in the 68 Theft Act itself. In addition to this, there is also an intentionality requirement, as you notice here. There is an intention by making the, mess rep the, the false representation to gain for himself or another or to cause another to expose another to a risk of loss. So... Fundamentally, the, the, the mens rea requirements for uh, false representation as part of Section 2 of the Fraud Act includes first this idea of dishonesty as defined by the case of Ivy and then uh, subsequently by the case of Barton. And then secondly, this intentionality requirement that you make a false representation with the intent to gain for yourself or for another or to cause loss to another or to expose another to a risk of a particular amount of loss. So that's what we mean when we talk about the mens rea requirements. And then finally, just as a as a uh, quick disclaimer for mens rea, as I've noted here, Section 2 of the 1968 Theft Act, as we remember back to previous lessons, fundamentally just defines what is meant by dishonesty as part of the remit of the Theft Act. That definition of dishonesty in the Theft Act does not apply to fraud cases. Um, only the definition of uh, dishonesty, as we see in the cases of things like Ivy, for example, um, are... Are, are, are representative of the concept of dishonesty that stretches across to fraud cases. So the Theft Act is speaking specifically about theft. The Fraud Act speaks specifically about fraud. The case of Ivy talks about the concept of dishonesty more broadly, given that it wasn't even a criminal case, but a civil case. To illustrate this point then, finally, let's talk about the 1982 case of Lambie. This was a case in which a defendant had been using a credit card which had taken uh, which had taken and exceeded their uh, sorry which had then sorry exceeded their limit its limit itself at this point it would be ordinarily proper for the individual who owns that credit card to uh, return the credit card um, but instead she decided to make another purchase with this credit card which had exceeded its limit it was argued that this amounted to a case of fraud by false representation. And the House of Lords concluded that when the defendant presented the credit card, which had been exceeded, this amounted to a representation. And specifically, it was a false representation because the representation that she had made in presenting this credit card was one of the authority on the part of the defendant to make the purchase, i.e. I have this credit card here and it therefore means that I can validly, va validly make a purchase on this credit card. When in reality, she could not. This credit card had exceeded its limit. And so the result was that the representation was false. The representation was therefore false. And of course, in the fact that she wanted to purchase an item using this exceeded credit card, she was using this false representation with an intent to gain, which of course then represents fraud for the legislation.
So in the previous lesson, what I did was talk about the concept of fraud by false representation. This is as defined in Section 2 of the Fraud Act from 2006. I noted that essentially fraud by false representation is where you make a false representation with the intent to gain or to cause somebody to lose. Uh, and we looked at a, a case in which an individual had exceeded her credit card limit and then went to make another purchase knowing that it had been exceeded. And then we noted that the idea of her going to the checkout with that exceeded credit card and trying to make a purchase on it was a false representation. It was a false representation because it was attempting to represent herself as somebody who was able to make a purchase, which is in case, obviously not something that could have been done. This lesson is going to talk about the next major element of the Fraud Act, which is the idea of fraud by failure to disclose. Now, fraud by failure to disclose is found in Section 3 of the legislation. And just like Section 2 of the legislation, in relation to, of course, theft, there are lots of overarching and fundamental linkages between each of these principles and ideas. So bear that in mind when you think about the way in which this legislation operates. So, what does Section 3 actually um, look like and pertain to? Well, what Section 3 actually essentially does is act as an omission crime or act like an omission crime. It is an offence which relates to the dishonest disclosure of information, namely the failure, dishonest failure to disclose information with the intent and for the purposes of making some kind of gain for yourself uh, rather than any uh, uh, than any other reason necessarily so that's what section 3 essentially requires and if we look at the the wording of the text we can see this clearly uh, analyzed and clearly um, stated because it says quote a person is in breach of this section if he dishonestly fails to disclose to another person information which he is under a legal duty to disclose and secondly intends by failing to disclose the information to make a gain for himself or another or to cause loss to another or to expose another to a risk of loss. So there are a few points that we can think about here. This really does speak to my point that I made in the previous lesson, which is that you could almost understand fraud as being one single crime with lots of different ways, or at least three different ways in which it can be committed. Because the wording of section three is actually almost identical to the wording of section two. The only distinction, the only distinction between sections two and sections three is the ways in which fraud is represented, the ways in which fraud reveals itself, okay, the act that you do to commit the fraud. So the actus reus elements between sections two and sections three are different, but every other part of this offense is the same. So rather than when in section two, you have fraud by false representation, you dishonestly make a false representation by uh, with the intention, sorry, to 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 gain or to cause another loss or exposure to loss. Whereas in section three, it is basically the same, except rather than making a false representation, you are just failing to disclose to another person information which you are under a legal duty to disclose. Let's illustrate this with a piece of case law. So the case of Firth, Firth sorry, from 1990 was a case that um, illustrates this idea of, of fraud by failure to disclose. Now, it's a case which involves, uh, at a fundamental level, it's a, ca a case which involves a doctor um, who would use a hospital, which was actually under the remit of the National Health Service, I've written here NHS service, which just if you were to do the full abbreviation is the NHS National Health Service service. Um, anyway, <laughs> the NHS service to perform treatments under a number of private clients on a number of private clients. So basically he was treating private clients, but he was doing so in a publicly funded NHS hospital. 
Now, this is actually ordinarily uh, not necessarily a bad thing, so long as um, you actually um, are charged by the hospital for the use of that equipment and for those for those facilities. The hospital did not charge the doctor or the clients for the use of the facilities, and they did so because they believed um, that the clients were not private, that the clients were actually NHS patients. And the doctor had not told the hospital that these clients were private. So he had failed to disclose this information. While this was not under the remit of the Fraud Act, because of course this was a case from the 1990s and fraud is in a, in a case that takes place in 2006, it was held that um, this was an offence that was something that closely mirrored that of Section 3. Um, which is the idea of, of, of deception, a deception offence. It closely mirrored that uh, and also includes that of an omission. So fundamentally, the reason why if this was a case that was tried today, it would almost definitely fall under Section 3 of the Fraud Act is because you are making a false, uh, sorry, you are making, you're failing to disclose information because you are failing to disclose as a doctor that the patients you are treating are not public patients they are not they are not uh, nhs patients they are private patients and you're doing so with an intention to essentially avoid the hospital um, from charging you or your clients you're basically getting a free um, a, a, a free service and free equipment and free facilitation for the performance of a private practice which is, of course, something that would cause you to firstly gain by not having to pay any money out to the hospital, but also the NHS service are losing. And so, as a result of which, and as a result of your dishonest failure to disclose information, you have essentially caused yourself to gain and cause a hospital to lose out, which then therefore represents a textbook definition and a textbook case of Section 3 false uh, fraud by failure to disclose. In this final lesson looking at the subject of fraud, what I'm going to do is talk about fraud by abuse of position. This is the third and final uh, method by which fraud could take place. And just like with the other two, keep in mind the fact that there is quite significant and extensive linkages between this subject, this idea, and the subjects and ideas that we discussed when we looked at theft. There is also a lot of discussions and linkages between the idea of fraud by abuse of position and the idea of all of the other fraud offences that we've previously examined in other lessons. So the focus in this lesson is going to be on section four of the Fraud Act. This is fraud by abuse of position. Now, technically, I've, I've already made this very uh, point very clear, but I then have written in the uh, presentation um, that uh, fraud is technically denoting multiple different crimes. Each of them share great many similarities and all share similarities and principles we studied when we looked at the crime of theft. This is something that I've been speaking about m multiple times throughout this series of lessons. And one of the reasons why I think it's important to do this is because it, it, it sort of defangs the, the severity or at least the, the, the amount of com, uh, convoluted and complicated issues that you might need to think about when looking at fraud. Because fundamentally, if you think of fraud as three different and subjectively, uh, and subjectively distinct offences, then you might be a bit intimidated by the subject of fraud, or you might be a bit intimidated by studying fraud uh, and when it comes to revising this subject. But if you just think about it as three of the same offences technically, uh, but with some ever so slight minor uh, differences, uh, especially relating to the fact, uh, at the act, sorry, in terms of commission, then it sort of reduces the uh, extent to which fraud is considered to be such a scary and difficult offence to study. Uh, and then if you then think about how the, how it links so closely with theft, then theft and fraud, the two crimes together, while representing quite a significant amount of study time on this series and in any textbook, actually uh, is reduced down to some of just the most key and basic principles of dishonesty, of appropriation, of things like uh, things like intent, all of which are very, very uh, important elements. So we're going to start by just reading through the legislation, which is section four of the 2006 Fraud Act. A person is in breach of this section if he occupies a position 
in which he is expected to safeguard or not to act against financial interests of another person. They dishonestly abuse that position and intend by means of abuse of that position to make a gain for himself or another, to cause loss to another or expose another to a risk of loss. A person may be regarded as having abused this, his position even though his conduct consisted of an omission rather than an act. So subsection 2 just tells us that it is act and omissions based. Now, fundamentally, this is very similar to the other two examples. The mens rea for fraud by abuse of position is essentially exactly the same. It requires a certain amount of dishonesty and it requires a certain amount of intention to uh, make a gain for himself or another or to cause loss to another or to expose another to a risk of loss. Both of those are the same as sections three and sections two. The difference, of course, is the actus reus of this offence, the idea of occupying first a position in which you are expected to safeguard and to not act against the financial interest of another person, and then secondly, to abuse that position. Those are the two actus reus elements. You have to do so, of course, with an element of dishonesty, and you have to do so with an intent to, to make a gain or to cause loss. Now, very quickly then, let's just think of an example from the case law, because fundamentally this is, this is a relatively straightforward area of the law. Um, there's not really that much to go off in terms of understanding what fraud is and what fraud isn't. Uh, fundamentally, it is very similar to that of theft, and once you've studied the, the groundworks of this subject, the study of theft, uh, you fundamentally, um, if you know what theft is, you can basically come to a conclusion as to what fraud is quite easily. So let's talk about the case here, okay? Uh, this is the case of Crown versus Value Jeeves, or Value Jeeves, um, from 2014. It was a case which involved a number of labour suppliers, and these labour suppliers had made a number of just unjustified, sorry, dedication uh, de uh, deductions in pay, as well as unjustified fines and warranties. That's a, a typo there, deductions in pay, rather than de dedications in pay. Um, these were unjustified fines and also a number of warranties. They were, as a result of these unjustified deductions and fines and warranties, in fact charged under Section 4 of the Fraud Act for, as you can guess, obviously, for fraud by abuse of position. This was, however, appealed since it was argued that there was no expectation for an unlicensed labour supplier to safeguard the financial interests of their workers. So they challenged the charge of Section 4 on the basis that there was not an expectation to safeguard the financial interests of their workers. And so as a result of which they did not have this abuse by abuse of position um, uh, uh, relationship between those who are the victims of this offence and those who are the perpetrators. So if we go back to the Fraud Act itself, they argued that they did not satisfy uh, subsection 1A the occupying a position in which you are expected to safeguard or not act against the financial interests of another person. Now, this was an argument that was, uh, however, rejected by the Court of Appeal. And what this case shows is that there are situations where a breach can take place that isn't one of a fiduciary relationship, but it could still therefore be covered under Section 4 of the Act. So they were still found um, to have um, committed fraud by abusive position. And what I mean here, of course, by fiduciary relationship is just simply a relationship of trust and confidence. Um, this is a kind of relationship that you can see in various different circumstances. Uh, if, when you study, if and when you study the law of trusts, for example, you will cover the idea of a fiduciary relationship. The trustee, for example, has a fiduciary relationship and a fiduciary obligation to the beneficiaries under the trust. In addition to this, you can think about other kinds of relationships which may be fiduciary in nature, such as, for example, a client and a solicitor, an accountant and a, and a client, a doctor and a patient, all of which are relationships of trust and confidence. 
What this case illustrates, though, is that Section 4 of the Act, when they go and they say that you occupy a position in which you are expected to safeguard or not act against the financial interests of another person, that is not suggesting that they are exclusively talking about a fiduciary relationship. You can still occupy a position in which you are expected to safeguard while also not being a fiduciary, uh, having a fiduciary relationship with the victims of this offence.